Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Gwendolyn Perry Davis, Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer here at the Museum of Contemporary Art. I'm thrilled to have you join us tonight in celebrating the release of Chef Jason Hamill's book, The Lula Cafe Cookbook, published by Faden. In 2017, this museum opened Marisol, a restaurant named in honor of the artist Marisol, whose object was the first one to enter our permanent collection. Building Marisol was part of an intentional effort to create more free public gathering spaces for you to enjoy. Marisol invites visitors to gather, converse, and enjoy a meal in a space with world-class contemporary art. After its completion, the MCA asked Jason Hamill, executive chef of Lula Cafe, to serve as Marisol's consulting chef. Fortunately for the MCA, he agreed. And with him came an atmosphere that nourishes, inspires, and celebrates our visitors and diners. I suspect that Jason needs no introduction to all of you, but please indulge me for a minute. Chef Hamill has championed seasonal cuisine in Chicago for over two decades, making Lula Cafe in Logan Square, where he is executive chef, a pioneer of the farm-to-table movement. He was one of the first chefs to source local organic ingredients and build close relationships with Midwestern farmers, which supports the region many of us call home. In addition, he co-founded Pilot Light, a nonprofit chef-centered organization that writes food-based curricula for Chicago public schools. Now with the publishing of Lula Cafe Cookbook, foodies everywhere can turn its colorful pages and join Jason and Lula's mission to create amazing food at home. Tonight, Chef Hamill will be joined by Amy Cavanaugh, the dining editor of Chicago Magazine, for a lively discussion. Amy is originally from Massachusetts, has been covering Chicago's dining scene since 2010, so that makes her a Chicagoan in my view. In her decade or so of writing, Amy has brought attention to, to the many contributions of Chicago's culinary curators and professionals providing to the readers that this city, proving to the readers that this city is one of the best food cities in the world. Again, we don't need to know that. So please join me in welcoming Chef Jason Hamill and Amy Kavanaugh to the stage. Hello. I'm super excited to be here tonight to talk to Jason about his wonderful book. Um, when the MCA reached out to ask me if I'd be willing to chat, I said immediately, this book is gorgeous. Um, and Jason is obviously, you know, such an important part of our culinary community. Um, you know, I talk to restaurant, talk to people at restaurants all the time, and Lula comes up as people's favorite so often. It's one of my favorites as well. Um, and so to kind of kick things off, Jason, um, you know, I was kind of hoping you could talk about what makes Lula kind of a special place for so many people and how did you capture that in the book? Um, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, really happy to be here. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I do think Lula is a special place, not just because <laughs> it's mine. Um, it's ours. Um, it, Lula took me in um, uh, from New Haven, Connecticut. I moved here in the 90s um, before it was Lula. Um, it was a cafe uh, called Logan Beach. Uh, it's where I met my wife, Leah Childs, and where we started this adventure together. Um, and at the time, that cafe meant everything to me. It was the center of my community. It's where I met all of the people that were important to me in my 20s. It was also where I really you know, came upon the spirit of, um, of the makers, doers, creatives in the neighborhood that really sort of lifted me up in my 20s and made me think that I could do whatever, you know, whatever I set out to do. Um, so I think Lula's special because it still has that, the, the energy of its origin is still like kind of palpable now. Mm -hmm. So it's maintained that kind of spirit of being, you know, uh, 27, which I was, and like, just giving it a shot and not, you know, having a concept or a business plan or any of those kinds of things at the outset. So it maintains that community spirit. Uh, and it's now 24 years later, and that's what I, I do feel like special in that, in that sense. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, after 24 years, what kind of made this the right time to do the cookbook? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll get to this, but I've always wanted to write something um, uh, about, uh, I mean, I just wanted to write. I don't, didn't exactly know what I wanted it to be about. Um, but during the pandemic, uh, I felt this like urgency to capture what Lula was in my life. Um, and in our lives, it wasn't just me. I mean, it's my family, um, but it's also the people who are a part of Lula, all of whom, you know, the pandemic just sort of changed our lives all of a sudden. So I felt this urgency and need to capture what had been happening, you know, on whatever, March 14th, 2020, um, that then on March 15th, 2020 was gone. Um, and the sense of protecting that was what really drove me in the writing. Uh, and once I started writing, it actually happened pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, that definitely, you know, the the urgency of, you know, what happened in 2020 comes through so well. Um, in terms of food, um, in the book, we have 90 recipes, mm -hmm. um, which really just kind of scratches the surface of what you've served over the years. How did you decide which ones to include? Yeah, I, I could have done 90 other ones yeah. <laughs> uh, easily. Um, there are only one or two that had to be in the book. Um, I, I think at the time, it's about what inspired me to write um, memories or ideas or thoughts about the dishes. So when I was flipping through the old notebooks and the old photographs, just like things would pop up in, in my mind about what I wanted to say about a particular dish. Mm -hmm. And that's what I gravitated toward. Um, it might even have just been like, oh, you remember this one? Yeah, it was that night that like, it rained really hard and nobody was in the restaurant and we came up with this dish and we only like made two of them, but it was so good. And so that memory might trigger a reason why like a fish dish is in that, in that book. It's mm -hmm. very personal in that sense. What were the two you had to include? Uh, well, uh, the carrot cake is on the last page, which is, uh, um, a, you know, classic Lula carrot cake is, uh, really delicious, but pasillaya is the first recipe. Um, and I assume people, some people in this room have had that, uh, pasta. <laughs> Um, it's my wife's dish. I take no credit for it. And even then it's a family dish of hers that has, uh, you know, assume, you know, I presume been around for generations. Um, but it's mostly associated with her grandmother. Um, and it's just this dish that it's right there, um, on the screen. Is it moving? Um, and it's a uh, bucatini, brown butter, cinnamon, garlic, and, um, feta. And, it just has this, it's a very simple dish. It's really easy to mess up. Um, and it takes a little bit of technique to get the timing and the brown butter right. And I just feel like, I wrote this later in the book, there's that famous Sophia Loren quote, um, everything you see I owe to spaghetti. Um, and I, I wrote everything you see I owe to pasta yaya. Um, because it's this combination of like, tradition and lineage, which is important to me, um, both from my family and from Leah's, um, combined with like technique, like I'm interested in cooking technique and what happens when you work with just a few ingredients in the right way. And then like an outside ingredient, because cinnamon is one that people don't expect to see in savory food a lot. And the cinnamon and just the way it works with the brown butter and the feta and the salty feta just to me is really evocative. and. Um, it's something that I search for in all the other dishes that we've done in the years since. Yeah, it's definitely one of the ones that I'm going to make first, for sure. I hope so. Um, you know, kind of talking a little bit about heritage, um, your own Italian-American heritage comes through um, in the book quite a bit. Um, you talk about, you know, ragu bubbling on your grandmother's stove mm -hmm. um, and having pasta and clams with your father. Um, and you also spent some time living in Italy as well. Um, how would you say your upbringing and memories inform your experiences of food? I would, I mean, I'd say looking back how center centered in my life, like eating with my family was, um, as, as the nuclear family, we ate together every night. Um, but it was really my grandmother's all, I have three of them that, um, through marriage and all of them were really, um, the really great cooks, but also just had really w warm tables, mm -hmm. you know, especially um, my maternal grandmother. Um, and I think like looking back at, you know, just what food and that, that meant to me, I, I 
just fell in love with the idea of exploring it. And often you're exploring the disillusion of the heritage rather than the, like the purity of it or something like mm -hmm. that. I was looking at all the ways that it's fallen apart, the ways that it's, you know, sort of dissolved. Um, and I got really interested in that and tried to explore it as much as possible in my like personal life. And then when I became a chef, um, the like being Italian all of a sudden became like way more important than it ever had been to me, um, strangely. And then uh, my grandparents also owned a restaurant. Um, it was a tiny like four booth diner. Um, they didn't open it up until they were in their 50s, which is you know, uh, crazy. They just had my, you know, my grandparents had a lot of sort of menial jobs and my grandfather was a truck driver and stuff like that. And they kind of scrapped together enough money to rent this little storefront and then really put together um, a little life, like the two of them just like cooking and serving. He was a cook, she was a server. Um, and thinking back about like these lineages, these sort of the secret histories of families that actually provide foundational like i don't know just um possibility um i it, it makes sense to me now you know mm -hmm. same for leah's family is in food as well they were they owned um several food businesses in chicago um and so we both looked at each other like okay i guess we're in this as well you know yeah and all of that you know comes through so well in the book um it also you know you include recipes from lula cooks and servers as well um, and recipes from your childhood. Um, you know, it just comes through just how personal cooking is um, to, to you, you know, at the restaurant. Um, how did you kind of approach bringing this idea of the personal to the book? I, I mean, for me, that's what I get out of being a chef. Um, it's, I mean, even the relationships with the farmers are extremely personal. I find like the idea of making a dish that someone else has made before me, like, you know, very, like a, a very human, like interconnected thing. I find, you know, going to the market and buying like a vegetable from somebody that I know and then making that vegetable, like a very interpersonal connected human thing. And that's what brings value to my life. I don't know how else to say it besides that. Like, I think it's, that's the center of the value in terms of my work um, is the interconnectedness, the recognition that like, you know, two people are, you know, connected and, and sharing something that uh, is, is valuable to them. So to me, cooking isn't extremely personal. And, um, and then when you start to be a chef and you're like teaching other people what to do or leading a group of people, that's also personal. It's also about, you know, uh, culture and of leadership is indeed like a very deeply personal thing. So I think in all respects, I, I, do, I do think I'm putting myself into the work. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and you know, th this book is very much a writer's cookbook. Um, you know, I read a lot of cookbooks um, for my job all the time, and the the writing here is just incredibly beautiful and evocative. Um, and you have such a strong writing background. You studied creative writing under David Foster Wallace um, at Illinois State. Um, prior to writing the book, how much was uh, writing part of your daily life? It was all of my daily yeah. writing. <laughs> Um, prior to writing the book, I, I was, I went to graduate school for creative writing in downstate. Then I moved to Chicago. I had a job as a cook. I was going to Logan beach, the cafe where Lula is now every day with like, you know, the notebooks and trying to write this novel about, you know, uh, living in Chicago in my, in the nineties, uh, as a 20 year old. Um, you remember we had that horrible heat wave in 95, I think. And I was writing a novel about that. Um, you know, I, I was like two, 300 pages in, I was really serious. And, uh, I actually, I mean, and then when Lula happened, I just stopped. It was like, mm -hmm. I didn't do any more writing after that. So that was, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been lucky to be able to write a few food pieces here and there over the years, but this is the first time I really be, was able to dig in and do something that was longer and more involved. Mm -hmm. And how was it kind of getting back to the practice of writing? I mean, I, 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 feel, I felt like I had never left it. I really, I mean, it was a very enjoyable thing for me. That said, I was doing it in between moments of running a restaurant. So it was a lot of like, uh, I, you know, I did it on in, in the basement where the olive oil and the, you know, napkins are stored, you know, like on <laughs> yeah. a card table. It, it's not glamorous. Um, and there was no writer's retreat or cabin in the woods. It was yeah. like <laughs> sometimes on top of milk crates. Um, 
so uh, yeah, you know, go downstairs, write a few lines and come up and see, make sure the food is going out all right and then go back down. Um, so, but that, that process is so, um, I mean, it's obviously like very, there's very solo, you know, you're by yourself in front of a screen writing and looking at the words either come or, you know, refuse to come. And I, you know, that in contrast to the life that I had chosen, you know, leading a group of like now 70 or 80 people is, it was very different and also something that I really did enjoy and, and will be doing a lot more of in the future years, you know. Yeah, and you know, I'm also kind of interested in the the process of putting books together. Once you kind of had selected your recipes and written, what was uh, the process like to put the rest together? Um, so I mean, I really made a lot of effort to try to show that Lula is a collaborative environment. Um, you know, we don't. Uh, there's a group of chefs. We sit together and work on dishes dishes together. Um, and there was one, um, Sarah Rinkovich, who is actually the chef de cuisine here at the museum uh, when we first opened, who came back, um, she's a private chef now, and came back to help me uh, sort of dig through the old notebooks and the memories and the pictures and try to recreate some of the dishes that we did years ago. Because re recipes are, you know, especially restaurant recipes, they're, they're not built for <laughs> time. You know what I mean? You're, you mm -hmm. did something one day and like, then you kind of figured it out together. And um, it, it definitely required going back and retesting and trying, uh, measuring and doing things anew. So that took a better part of a year to, to dig through these recipes and cook together, which we did after hours at Lula during the pandemic. So Lula was closed to the public and we were you know, selling to-go food out the front front door and in the back we were working on these recipes. Um, and then when we got to the stage where we were taking the, the photos of them, that's a fascinating stage. We worked with a, a Chicago photographer, Carolina Rodriguez, who moved to Los Angeles uh, again in the pandemic. So she came back out and we took all these photos in my home kitchen. Um, you know, uh, we tried a photo studio for a little while and just felt again, like there mm -hmm. was a lack of like, connection and just uh, intimacy there. So we scrapped it and we just, they're all done on my kitchen table. So- um, And all cooked yeah, in your home kitchen? Yeah, the whole thing. That's so cool. Um, and so, you know, you we talked about kind of your start as a writer, but how did you move from writing to cooking? So, I mean, it's very simple. I went to graduate <laughs> school and if anybody's gone to graduate school, I, I ran out of money like month yeah. two. <laughs> Um, so I turned to the guy next to me, his name is Frank. Um, and I was like, Frank, I have no money. What do you do for money? And he's like, I'm a cook at a restaurant at night. Come join me. And uh, you know, that was in normal Illinois. Um, it's a uh, place is gone now, but I'll charitably call it an off brand California pizza kitchen. <laughs> um, so that was my first job cooking in a restaurant. Um, and after that, I worked at a, a, another illustrious job at TGI Fridays. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then came up to Chicago. And that's when I started hanging out at Logan Beach and, and met Leah. And we transformed Logan Beach into, into Lula. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that... Um comes through so well in the book is, is this sense of time. And, you know, you really bring us to those early days of Lula, you know, from the time hanging out at Logan Beach to those days just kind of building something. Um, and as I was reading the book, I just noticed, you know, so many little references to time um, throughout the book, whether it's, you know, food is a moment in time or, you know, cooking techniques can stop time. Um, as a chef, how does thinking about time factor into your cooking? Oh, I, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I love that question in part because I hate measurements of time in cooking. Um, and it's something that I'm always, I'm always talking to my mom about because she's like, how long is this supposed to cook for? I'm like, well, let's look at it and like touch yeah. it and like <laughs> see what it's doing. And like, is it smell right? She hates that. Um, um, but you know, it's obviously relative in cooking and you, you want to experience the, the transformation of like an onion from a, you know, uh, something that you can't see through into something that you can, you know, like those moments take time. Uh, but furthermore, like in terms of like looking at, you know, like a 24 years of work in terms, you know, back in this moment, like looking back at, at it, 
I recognize that the way that we do the menus at Lula were, was kind of profound for this process because we stamp, every day we stamp menus with a banker's stamp. Um, we've been doing it forever um, because we change the menu every day. And like when we started a restaurant in 1999, you know, restaurants did not change their menu every day. It was like, you know, you'd get them printed at a printing yeah. shop, you know, and it, it, it just, we didn't even have a, you know, like people didn't have printers. Um, so the idea of like doing that and doing the work of like working with the farmers and making little changes, however, uh, however minute, they were important every single day and then making sure that the stamp is there. Like, why is the stamp there? The stamp's there to tell you that this is only for today. Like the, the, the food that we're making is, you know, it's ephemeral. It's gonna come, we're gonna make it, it's gonna come, you're gonna eat it and leave and that moment is gone. And so like recognizing how precious that moment is and recognizing how precious the moments are between people and especially in a restaurant where people are celebrating birthdays or, you know, first dates or just like getting together with a family or having a great conversation that you never expected to have. Like those things are not going to happen again. Um, so I feel like pointing that out in the book over and over and over again was really important to me. And also the ideas that you know, these recipe, like recipes aren't necessarily things that are there to recreate the dish, but to teach you how to create something else, you know, mm -hmm. and um, because you can't go back and do the dish the same way again, it's never going to be exactly the same. So then you try something and it's new for you that day. And hopefully you're with people and having a great conversation that makes that day really special as well. So that's where the stamp comes in mm -hmm. and like how I think a lot about, you know, time and, you know, maybe I'm just being nostalgic, though, I don't know. <laughs> well, I feel like I, you know, so often think about food in, in relation to nostalgia and, you know, that yeah. came through so oh, much in the book. so much. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all, all my grandparents have passed, my Leah's, you know, you know, parents have passed, my dad's not with us anymore. So, like, all that stuff is, like, really connected to, to food and food memories, so many of them. Absolutely. Um, and we've talked a little bit about community and you know it, it just seems um that you know even before lula was open when it was logan beach you know community was key to the identity of that space um and how would you say like community and collaboration helped define the restaurant um well first and first and foremost i i think you need to write i mean i recognize that there is no like um i mean i might be the leader at lula but like i don't you know, people, other people do the work. Um, I work, I'm there with them, but I mean, it's, you know, when someone, when you walk on the dining room and someone's like, oh, did you make this tonight? And I'm like, yeah, me and 30 other people. Um, <laughs> so recognizing the, like the, the labor in the restaurant and how important it is that every one of these jobs from, you know, from the people that are there at four or five in the morning to the people who close at night, like trying to recognize the, um, how important each of those steps, I. I try to do in the book. Um, that's the first community that matters to me is, you know, after my family, the first community is the, the community of people that work together. And like, if you're talking about hospitality and care and like wanting to um, create community, you start, you know, you start there. And if we can take care of the people who are working for us, like, you know, the hope is that they'll take care of others. And then that just extends out into the neighborhood um, very easily until you start, you know, working with people who are doing, um, you know, social work projects in the neighborhood. Like we we have a, a project where we um, we cook um, meals uh, for uh, community dinners at Avondale every single Thursday. So now it's been three four years that we've been doing it. So and 150 meals a week. Um, so we've just been doing that, uh, it's part of our prep project. It's like, everybody does it together. So that just came out of the, you know, like the beginnings of, you know, when you cook for each other, uh, every day we cook, we, we call family meal, like we put up food for the staff, like that idea of putting up food for the staff just becomes the same idea as putting up food for the, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the church down the street on Kedzie that we work with. So it's it sort of just transfers out as like rings uh, of community out from the center. That kind of leads into my next question too, which is um, about Chicago's culinary community. Um, you know, you talk about how chefs like Paul Kahn kind of helps you get started mm -hmm. um, and how you have such close um, connections with many of the chefs in the city. Um, what kind of makes Chicago's culinary community community is so special? That I don't know, but it, <laughs> I can tell you it is special. Yeah. I can't tell you why, I don't know why. 
Uh, maybe somebody out there can write about this. Um, but there is something. It is a hundred percent true, and I I have humbly asked my friends at other in other cities, is it like this? You know, here, and the answer is no. Um, maybe there's a city out there that competes, but our for some reason our community of chefs is super tight. Um, and when I came here um, in the '90s, I you know when we opened the restaurant, we literally knew nothing, and people like Paul and Rick and um, and others uh, sort of gave us all the numbers. You know, like oh, here's my plumber, here's my you know my pork guy, here's the guy that does you know the grease trap cleaning or whatever. And trust me, I needed all those numbers. I had no idea what we were doing. Um, and um, now it's this thing where, um, especially after the pandemic, but even before, where people are just really ready to help each other. There's, you know, I have a foundation called Pilot Light. I could call anybody and they would be like, well, what do you want me to do? I'll be there tomorrow. It's always like that. Um, and then just sharing information, sharing generosity, you know, talking, giving, you know, it's not, there's no secrets. There's no like sense of competition. There's just a, like an abundance setting in the Chicago culinary community that is not in other cities as far as I can see. Yeah. And, you know, you have so many um, amazing alums who've come through Lula. Um, they've gone on to open places like Loaf Lounge, Middlebrow, Giants. Um, those are some of my favorite restaurants. Um, you're also a partner in Supercana, mm -hmm. um, working with Yoshi Yamada and Zizun Shah, who were actually on our best pizza list today. They're on the best pizza at list. At Chicago Just Magazine. Um, how do you kind of see your role as helping the next generation of chefs? I mean, um, I never sought to do that, and I don't. I mean, I hope that I continue to do to do that in the future. I think that Lula is. I mean, again, it's a special place, has a real strong sense of community, but it's also a learning kitchen. We change the menu a lot, and so when you're a cook at Lula and you don't know what you know chanterelles are, you find out really quickly. But all of a sudden, those, that season is gone, and now it's matsutakes, and then you find out what that season is, and then oh, wait, it's lobster mushrooms, and you find out. So all of a sudden, you're like through three types of mushrooms in you know six weeks, and you're like, okay, now I understand how to clean all these different mushrooms. Um, that happens a lot at Lula with young young chefs who get swept up into the changing menu and learning how to deal with. Um, the products, and then I have this like amazing team of people that they work with. Um, so you learn a lot um, on the line at Lula because of how the menu changes. And for that reason, and it's hard, it's busy, and it's not the easiest kitchen to work in. It's probably one of the harder ones, just physically how it's set up. It was never intended to be a restaurant. You know, you have to go downstairs and upstairs, and you know, oh, wow. it's like you're running around everywhere. Um, so for that reason, like if you can work there and figure it out, like it's other jobs probably seem a little easier. And so um, you get your reps in when you're a cook at Lula. <laughs> and like this, I was just in LA uh, doing um, a similar thing and I bumped into two line cooks from 12 years ago that both own restaurants in California. Um, there are a lot of people like that that I'm super, super proud of. Um, Birdies in Austin, Texas is a Lula alum that is a, it's an, a great, a great it's restaurant. It's high on my list. Yeah, it should be. One of the best restaurants in the country, according or the best restaurant, according to Food & Wine magazine the other day. Um, yeah. And there's others. Every, every time I turn around, I, I, there's so many great people who are doing really cool stuff out there. That's incredible. Um, I did want to ask a question. Um, since we're in an art museum, um, Lula's art program okay. is something that you know, is, is notable, and you have a curator we do. That. Can you yeah. talk about how that kind of came together? Um, well, our first, one of the first um, people, uh, the person who told me to go to Logan Beach the first time was an artist. And he also told me about Logan Square because I hadn't been to Chicago. And he's like, you got to go to this cafe and go to this neighborhood. There are a lot of artists there. You'll love it. Um, his name was Jonathan Liss. And he, uh, when we got the restaurant space from Logan Beach, he was like, let me put some art up. I'll find people to do it. And that's how this like curator program was born. And over the years, we've had uh, four cur curators who have gone into the community and found, it's mostly like friends of friends, but like great work that is always super surprising, changes four times a year, 
Um, and I can't, I have nothing to do with it. Yeah. Like <laughs> what well, literally I don't even look at, we don't vet it. We don't, mm-hmm. they can do whatever they want as long as it's like family friendly, you know, that's like really cool. Whatever they want. Yeah. Are there any pieces that have kind of struck you over the years? Oh yeah. Um, uh, Todd Baxter, Baxter, who's a photographer who's moved to California, did these like in crazy, um, so I, I don't know how even how to describe them. Uh, Cody Hudson, who's a Chicago artist, um, uh, who I, I guess I can announce this now. So uh, I'm going to tell you something new that's happening. I didn't even think to. We're about to start an artist poster series oh, awesome. next month. Um, and we'll do one a year where an artist that we've shown does a Lula poster. And then we, we raise money for charity doing that. And Cody Hudson's going to be our first poster artist. Um, and so he's a Chicago artist that did a great show, uh, earlier this year. So those are two that I can think of. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, it, you know, in the book, you talk a lot, um, about other cookbooks. Um, you know, you didn't go to culinary school, but you mentioned how you read books, um, by chefs and food writers from Charlie Trotter to Alice Waters to Judy Rogers, Elizabeth David. Yeah. Um, can you talk about what those books meant to you and how you kind of used them to bring you on your culinary path? Yeah. I mean, first of all, the first time I heard Alice Waters' name, I thought the person was talking about Alice Walker. So I, I really needed to, I needed to brush up at the first year. Um, okay, those books are writerly books. I mean, well, they're not all writerly books, but um, Judy Rogers, Elizabeth David, they're great writers. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was writing the introduction to our book, I thought a lot about Judy Rogers. Um, she's a chef from California who sadly passed away from cancer a, a little while ago. Um, but she said she was the chef of Zuni Cafe and she wrote a, one of the most, the most brilliant cookbooks ever. But Trotter, for example, was a great book that, you know, the, the early books of Trotters that Leah and I really got excited about because it was one of the first times that you could really see like a seasonal sensibility that mm-hmm. vegetables book is broken down by month. And it was like an aha moment for me to see like, how the food changed, not just ingredient wise, but like the palette by that, I mean the color palette and the, like the sense of like freshness, how it like kind of raised up in the spring and summer and just the, with the way that they thought about the textures and the, um, the form of the food. That book is brilliant. And that really set us on a like a particular path where we're like, I gotta find everything out about trotters and like, you know, went to figure out where he bought his vegetables and where, like, you know, where he did everything. And then, you know, years later, I'm like best friends with Matthias Murgis, who is, mm-hmm. was the chef during all those years. And I never, I never met him then, but I was looking at him from afar. Did you ever dine there? Oh yeah, I have a funny Trotter story. <laughs> um, we, um, for our first anniversary, our staff put together their money and bought us to a gift certificate to go to Trotter's. Uh, we hadn't really been to a fine dining restaurant before, and we were super excited to go. Um, we went, we had an amazing meal, and then on the way out, Trotter was standing there, and we introduced ourselves and said that we were chefs from Logan Square, and he said, London Square? I've never heard of that restaurant. <laughs> Where's London Square? I'm like, Logan Square. Um, and then he said, well, uh, come back here tomorrow at noon. And we were like, well, we can't do that. We own a restaurant. Um, and the man, the, the man standing next to him was a, a server at the restaurant. He said, you don't say no to Charlie. Be back here at 12 o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> so we, we had no employees to work that shift. So we had to like call a friend in or I don't know what we did. But, um, and we went to Trotter's a second time, 12 hours later or whatever it was. Um, and we, we got to eat on this meal. There was like a special lunch in there. And we were, Lee and I were so scared of like being there that we like went into the room and like hid in the corner <laughs> and we, there was a small table in the corner and we're like, let's get that table. We sat over there and Charlie watched in the room and looked at us, made us stand up, picked the table up <laughs> and carried it across the room and set it down next to somebody else's table. And then we had lunch next to people so that we would meet people. <laughs> That's what happened. Uh, that's funny. That, and that also just, you know, continues to speak to the, the community kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, helping yeah. each other out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you recently did a talk at the Welcome Conference in New York um, about the emotional labor of working in the food industry and the limits to what people can give. I did. Um, can you talk more about that? 
yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to think more about this. Um, please look it up if you, you want to see the, the talk. But it's about, um, you know, we think a lot, we, in our business, we think about the division between service and hospitality, wherein um, service is like getting what you need um, and hospitality is how you feel when you get what you need. And, you know, one thing can be taught and we can train people on like the correct spoon goes here and, you know, wipe the table at this point. Um, but like how you feel, how people feel when they're in a restaurant, that's like much harder to deal with, right? Um, but I've been thinking a lot about how the people who give the hospitality feel um, and what it's like to care for other people um, uh, as a job in an exchange for money. Um, and like what that does uh, to people's, you know, um, you know, sense of self and their ability to care for themselves. Because it's no secret that in the restaurant industry, people have a hard time caring for themselves. In fact, they often do the opposite. Um, so it was a lot about how um, sort of exchanges of care happen in restaurants and how difficult it is for people to center like the self-care that they need at the beginning of that process. And I just talked about my own path through that and like how, um, you know, how frankly difficult it is. And I, I think like a lot of, um, there's some attention to this. And I think, I, I, honestly, I think the bear does a good job looking in, I'm sorry to bring up the bear, but I think it does, <laughs> and it really does a good job at like focusing on the like conflict between like caring for your, you know, your career, your art or your passion and individuals in your life versus, you know, the individuals on the team and never mind the guests, you know, because you're, you know, obviously expected to have the end result be like care for other people, often strangers, some of whom are like, you know, great to care for and some less so. Um, you know, so there's a lot of like sort of transfers and exchanges of care as like almost like a commodity that happens in a restaurant. I think that's really interesting and worth exploring. I'm definitely gonna be writing about that. In yeah, I, you know, it, it's such an interesting topic to kind of delve into, um, but I was I'm gonna, gonna ask you if, how you thought about the bear in relation to that. Um, <laughs> but, but, and it's, you know, as also something that's shown such a good culinary light on yeah. Chicago. Yeah, I just spent yesterday with Courtney uh, Storer, who is one of the creators and a friend of mine, and I think that they do a really good job, like looking at the, the difficulty uh, in the work. And, you know, I know it's glam there's some parts of it that have been glamorized, and I, I know that doesn't get everything right about Chicago. I know you cannot take the L and to Avec. You know what I mean? <laughs> I get that, but it, you know, and I don't think you can rip them up for that. You know yeah. I mean? It's, uh, it's evocative in a way, and it really does look at, I mean, like the family relationships and some of the difficulties that all of us have had in the business of dealing with the interactions between personal life at home and, and work life, or they're, they're valid and like really evocative. Never mind. I mean, I personally went through and Leah did. Um, a Mother's Day 2020 printer from hell uh, that spat out tickets faster than we can make the food. And that one scene is very real to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the pandemic has changed everything about restaurants. Yeah. Um, how did Lula come through? And how do you kind of see the pandemic still impacting restaurants? I mean, there was a lot of grace in a lot of moments. Like, just take that Mother's Day 2020, I mean, like we had hundreds of orders come through on a like DoorDash system that, you know, wasn't set up right or whatever, exactly like in the show. Um, and we had to, we were late and we had to get them done, like just the three, you know, three or four of us. It kind of, it was hell. But then, you know, um, I remember reaching out to people who maybe waited for their food longer than we wanted them to. And every one of those people had a lot of grace and empathy for us. Um, so, I mean, the public was really, um, at least with Lula, like really thoughtful and, and caring. Um, and you felt that. I mean, the hard part was like, I wanted to care for the 80 people that we had employed on March 15th, and there was no possible way to do that. But without, I mean, without the help of others, the restaurant definitely would not be open. Like without the help of the community supporting us, without like literally without like federal help, like for sure, many, 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 many restaurants, including Lula, would not be here. Um, so you know, now I'm looking at it and being like, well, I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to 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 get through it. At the same time, like I mean, um, it just showed the fragility of the business 
and it is like a very, very fragile business. And uh, you know, we're lucky, we're super busy and established, but there are a lot of people who aren't. There are a lot of small family places that are, you know, that struggle making it work. Um, and there are successful ones that aren't as successful as you think they are, um, that are struggling to make mm -hmm. it work. So I do think that we have a lot to think about when it comes to valuing food and food experiences in the United States and like how that whole thing is built. But man, that's a minefield and you know, you know, yeah, crossing absolutely. that is gonna be pretty hard. <laughs> um, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, I, you know, you talked about how how enjoyable writing this book was and how you want to do more writing. Do you think you have another cookbook in you? I, I do. I, I have an idea for one, so I'm, I'm going to start working on it. But I think before then, I'm going to try to write some essays about the kind of stuff that I was talking about tonight. That's first. Nice. Yeah. Cool. I think we're going right. to open up to yeah. some questions <laughs> now. Is that, is that right? The lights turn up, and I can actually see who's yeah. out there. <laughs> Hi, Bob. How you doing? I think they're going to hand out microphones, or is that what's happening? So raise your hand high if you do want to get a microphone. Awesome. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I want to say how much I enjoyed this conversation, and also, Jason, the um, spirit of tradition, the inventiveness, and the sense of community that you bring to Lula Cafe every day. Thank you for all that you've done. Um, my question is very basic. <laughs> How did you come up with the name Lula okay. Cafe? Um, well, Leah was in a band called Tallulah. Um, and we kind of ran out of time finding a name. Um, I, I think um, the band was named after Tallulah, ba I don't think I know. The band was named after Tallulah Bankhead, the actor, um, who you know um, was in Lifeboat, among other movies. And I, the thing that I love about the name, now that it, you know, it's ours, is just the way it sounds. I just love the, like, how sonorous it is, and just like it's an easy, lovely, group of letters, and that's what I like about it. There's somebody over here, right? You can, if it doesn't work, you can also ask me. Oh, there you go. All good. Hot mic. Yeah, I can tell. Sorry. I don't know if I've ever used a microphone. Um, <laughs> hi, thank you for creating such a beautiful restaurant. I love Lula. Oh, it's thank like, you. I take everyone to Lula. Um, you talked a little bit about the emotional labor that service workers and people in hospitality who are customer facing do. Uh, I wanted to know how you, as like the leader of your clan, navigate like towing the line between being hospitable and protecting your staff. Um, the line has to be not like negotiated like almost on a constant basis. So. Um, what we do is talk all the time about negotiating that line. So I, I mean, I'm the kind of person who t tends to say yes to a lot of stuff. Um, so my staff is there to keep me in the yes and check a little bit. Um, but you know, we have um, daily meetings about um, where we stand on certain policies and, and issues. Um, we also have a system for when people feel overwhelmed or um, um, sort of tapped out of giving care to you know a particular individual or a group of people. So we try to support each other in that way. I do think that um, I've, I'm fortunate that Lula is a very friendly place, and like a lot of the people who come there are, uh, you know, by you know 90% of the time, like <clears throat> excuse me, like some really you know sweet and nice people. So we don't have to face the sort of like some of the vitriol and like difficulties that I've you know, read about constantly, especially in the pandemic. Um, that said, people are always, you know, people will tow, you know, cross the line and are difficult sometimes. Um, and we do have like communication systems to support people when they feel like they need to be supported in certain moments. Um, and we also are always talking about how to, like what's a good way to say no and like how, like what 
options we can give instead of just a flat no, um, how to give an expansive no that like leads people to other other places. But I, I mean, it is, that's the job. Like negotiating that line is like what I do for a living, I think, as my main role. Um, and supporting the team so they feel like they can give that care um, in many different types of circumstances. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else up top? Hey, hey. Hi. Um, quick question is more about the business of the book. Sure. Did you shop the book? Did Fadon come to you? Was it on the table already? Uh, what length of time was uh, sure. involved in getting it on the table and getting it in our hands? Um, about three years. Um, I did not shop the book. Um, I, they came to me, um, so, uh, which is great. And one of the things we hear, you know, community, uh, Jeremy Fox from Rustic Canyon in Santa Monica, California has one of the great cookbooks of all time called On Vegetables. Um, he, um, was the one who told Fiden that we would be a good choice for them. I mean, we're clearly like a, a you know, a, we're a pretty casual restaurant and, they do a lot of high, fine dining and high-end uh, restaurants, so I was, you know, very excited and eager to work with them. Um, and the way that they look at the book in terms of, like, as a work of art and the energy and uh, detail that they put into the photography and the printing, the printing is really spectacular. Um, I think, and the paper selection, et cetera, uh, was uh, amazing. So no, I didn't shop it. I was lucky, you know, um, and and. Definitely, the restaurant cookbooks are not as popular as they once were, so I feel really fortunate to be able to get mine out there in the world. Okay, oh yeah. Hi. Um, hey, hey. With uh, Halloween coming up, I know you do oh, a wonderful boy. job <laughs> for the community and with the cookies and the apple cider for the Logan Square costume parade, but I wanna talk about something that was done a few years in the past, how it came about where you embraced uh, your costume and you guys at Lula became a different restaurant. How people, did that come people about? People really miss this, don't and they? And I was gonna say, how'd that come about and will you ever do that again? Because it really was a remarkable thing. Yeah, you don't think I'm too old, huh? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Okay, well what we used to do is we used to dress up as another restaurant. I'm gonna be honest, the reason we stopped doing it is because like there were 10 restaurants that were all of a sudden doing it and we didn't feel like it was special anymore. And sometimes you gotta retire from like a really great, at, at your height. But we, we did amazing work. We were the violent hour, we were taco hell, we were uh, house of human, we were all sorts of really fun things. Uh, and it was a great time in our lives. But I don't know if we'll go back to it again. I feel like maybe it was like, you know, right time, right place, the band broke up. But uh, yeah, that was a special time. But we do do cookies for kids. And um, we've, so we're baking, I think we're gonna do 6,000 cookies uh, on the Sunday before Halloween. So come out to Logan Square. Up there. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for for this. Where are you? I, will you raise uh, I'm your right hand? here. I'm right okay. here. Sorry. Because uh, I'd like <laughs> to actually to look in. It's a disembodied voice otherwise. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this cookbook. Uh, you know, my, my wife and I, this is our favorite restaurant. And I can't speak for everybody in here, but uh, I, you know, these three people, this is, this is our favorite, favorite place. Thanks. Uh, my question for you, you were talking about uh, menus and stamping them with dates every single day. How do you catalog that? You know, how do you, you know, know what to refer back to if there's a particular dish that's going to maybe inform uh, another dish down the line? Yeah, we don't, I, we've never repeated a dish. Um, so that's, I mean, we definitely have repeated ideas, but there have always been like themes and variations. And I have this really cool, I have a website, my own website, that, you know, it's jasonhamill.com. But if you go on there, there's a list of the dishes that just scrolls like thousands of words uh, long. So we don't ever repeat them, um, which the rule against repeating them is there to like make sure that we're like staying alive and with, you know, um, in terms of our creative energy. Um, but there's definitely a style that's, you know, sort of come over, the, over time. Um, 
So I, you know, in terms of how we catalog them, not well. I'm working on that. Um, and we certainly, I think, in, in one part in the book, I say like one of the problems was that we we just didn't catalog a lot of the early years, like when, um, like when JV, when Jason Vincent was a sous chef at Lula, or um, Bunny Simmons from Cafe Marie Jean was a sous chef at Lula. I don't like a lot of those dishes are kind of lost to time. Um, but then last night when I was at this event, I mentioned there were two cooks that were from 12 to 15 years ago. One of them read that line in the book that I wrote that I had lost a lot of recipes. Um, and he brought, he printed out, I like typed up and printed out all of his little notebooks that he had over the years and handed them to me as a present. Yeah, super sweet, right? Cool. Let's keep it going. You know, I'll repeat it for you if you don't. Hi. You're welcome. Thank you. I am a one trick pony and I always get the breakfast burrito. Okay. It's amazing. It's not in the book, though. That's going to be book number two. That's okay. I go to Lulu's Um, My question for you one of the things I thought about when watching the bear is just like the relentlessness, the passion, the incredible energy that people put in night after night because obviously you have a new crew, you have new people every night. So I wonder just after doing this for 24 years, that's a good question um at, you know i'm i'm older than i was and i'm gonna be honest i'm more tired than i used to be but i still i'm still there doing it i i definitely i definitely want to show up for the team like i de i definitely want to be the one who's like willing to do the work um I, I feel like that represents well, and you know maybe maybe I'm wrong, and I've certainly had a, quite a few friends be like you know chill out a little bit, um, and also probably my family. Um, but I I like showing people that like I'm willing to do it, and I want to do it, and I when I have opportunity to, I like to get right in the center of it. So I like to expedite. I like to and you know expediting at Lula. Well, now that you've all seen the bear, you know that expediting is a really important job. Um, and it's super hard at, at Lula. I, I like doing it. It puts me at the center. It makes me feel like I can see everything. And uh, it shows like there's, I'm expediting to someone who's younger than my restaurant. And like the, you know, the other day, I, I, there was this um, a new cook, um, Ruben, across from me. And I'm like, I've been standing in this spot longer than you've been standing on the earth. <laughs> like, um, and I'm happy to do it. He's excited to be there, and like that gives me a relationship with him, and I don't want to be the owner that like doesn't know people's names and doesn't know how to make the breakfast burrito and isn't there. You know what I mean? I want to be able to do it. So as long as, you know, as long as I can, I'm going to keep trying. Awesome. Okay. Hi. Oh, a food scene in a novel, that's hard. Um, okay, I'm, I'm a pretty avid reader and I can just tell you that um, I like to read a lot of contemporary fiction and for, you know, almost always written by women. So um, I, you know, I am excited about lots of fiction, but I just, um, let's see, I just read this book called Checkout 19 um, that was beautiful, and I'm a huge like a Ra Rachel Cusk fan, and um, I don't know, you're stumping me, but I have a million books on my Kindle that I could think about, but oh my God, my favorite novel. I don't have one, I'm sorry. Just, I love, contem I love contemporary fiction. I'm like, I'm the kind of person who, I mean, I subscribe to The New Yorker, and I don't want to read the old ones, I want to read the one that came out that week, you know what I mean? And so I feel like reading, like, it's kind of like pop music. I want to read what's happening right now. So I'm always excited about um, whatever book is, you know, uh, Lauren Groff has this new book out that I just read called The Vaster Wilds. And it just came out and I read it and I feel, you know, it was a beautiful book. So I'm just always about like what's new. Um, and I think the book, you know, people say was gonna die a long time ago. It's so alive and so beautiful right now, all the writing that's, that's coming out. So how's that for an answer? Great, thanks.